Welcome everyone to episode two of Norwich Theatre Talks, our relaunched podcast. It's been fantastic to hear the feedback from those of you who listened or watched our first episode with Joe Tresini, which explored a number of areas relating to mental health, well-being and resilience. I'm delighted to be back here in Podcast Corner at the Playhouse for this, our second episode. And in this episode, we're going to be talking about and exploring the power of stories and storytelling. It's a concept that's utterly intrinsic to theatre and everything we do across our stages here at Norwich Theatre. But also, it's something that's profoundly important for all of us in our daily lives and humanity as a whole. How we share our stories, what that means for us, but how we listen to other people's stories and how they tell them and what we can learn from that. In this episode, I'm delighted to be joined by two individuals who have become legendary podcasters in their own right. So no pressure at all for me in that. And that's Norwich-born TV presenter, Jake Humphrey, and Professor Damien Hughes, a thought leader around the concept of high performance. And together they have created the High Performance Podcast, which is now listened to across the whole globe. Later in the episode, I'll also be introducing you again to another member of my fantastic Norwich Theatre team, this time Sam Dawson, our Head of Creative Engagement, and we'll be talking about our Creative Matters season, which seeks to platform this year stories relating to climate action and climate change. So I'm delighted to welcome the founders of High Performance Podcast, Jake Humphrey and Professor Damien Hughes. Guys, welcome to Podcast Corner at Norwich Playhouse. Our, our podcast episode today is focused on storytelling. So start off by telling us the amazing story of High Performance Podcast and, and how it came about. Go on, you go. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, actually, it probably came about from storytelling because... Um, <laughs> I'm good friends with Stuart Webber, who's the sporting director at Norwich City. And a few years ago, he said that we've got someone coming in to speak to the players um, to help improve results at the football club. Do you want to come and sit at the back and listen and see what, what gets said? And actually, it was the storytelling from Damien that impacted me. So I sat there and I listened to him talk about the previous clubs he'd worked at, the research that's been done in in the psychology world with various psychologists for hundreds of years about how to get the best out of teams and the best out of individuals. And it, it was stories that Damien was telling where I thought, man, I'd love to have a more of a conversation about this. And actually I'd for a long time harbored this desire to talk about high performance, to talk about lessons from the world that I was in, which is elite sports, running businesses, formula one, all the setbacks that you naturally have to deal with when you work in television. Yeah. But I, in all honesty, I just thought to myself, no one's going to care what a former kids TV <laughs> presenter has to say about how to have an elite mindset. So then when I saw Damien talking, I thought, wow, here's someone that can give some actual real life credibility to my ramblings. <laughs> um, and then I remember we were, my wife and I went to the Chelsea Flower Show and I was talking to her and I just said, I'd love to do, I still really want to do this podcast. And I've met this guy called Damien and it was actually Harry who said, well, just ring him and ask if he wants to ask if he'll do it. And yes. I said, I'd, and my opinion was, you know, like he was really successful and popular and busy. And he was a lecturer at Manchester University, he'd written books and stuff. I, and I remember saying to Harry, he's not going to say yes to doing a random podcast with a guy he's met once. <laughs> and she was all that just said, well, just give him a call and see what he says. Yeah, yeah. And I said, all right, well, I'll tell you what, when we get to London, we'll park up the car and I'll call him. And we parked up the car. And I rang him on the side of the street and I couldn't believe it when he went, yeah, that sounds great. <laughs> I'll give that a go, I'll give that a go. And that was it really. Um, yeah, yeah. And then we travelled together down to the south coast to meet Ben Ainsley for our very first ever record. Wow. And again, stories were the important element on yeah, that. Yeah. You know, I remember the two of us walking away and we thought this will work, didn't we? Yeah, yeah definitely. I think I'd, I'd, I'd back up what Jake said about storytelling being at the heart of, 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 of what the podcast is about. Yeah. But I, I, I've been lucky enough to spend a lifetime, um, an adult lifetime, going into sort of elite cultures. And one of the things that I've noticed is that 
you always come away with stories. Mm. The thing that you remember is not the stats or the facts or the figures, yeah, but yeah. you remember the stories. And I was lucky enough to be able to research this, and that was one of the areas that I wanted to look at about how storytelling actually contains so much wisdom yeah. that, that's contained within it. And I think that's what we try and do on the podcast of create, create a space for people to tell their stories because yeah. it's through those stories that that innate wisdom, that knowledge, the, uh, the lessons yeah, yeah. are being passed on to, uh, to listeners. That's right. And I, and I think, you know, the, the success of the podcast over a relatively short period of time, you've collated this and curated this amazing array of stories, mm. haven't you? And, and I've really enjoyed, and for, for those listening, the, one of the reasons I'm so lucky to have these guys here today is that um, Norwich Theatre and myself uh, working with Jake and Damien to create High Performance Live, a show that will open on Sunday the 5th of February at Norwich Theatre Royal and then tour after that. And what I've been struck by, by you guys is you really care about not only the stories that you're telling um, from the amazing range of people that you meet, but also the stories of the listeners. Mm. And Jake, I think you said to me once, this is as much about the people who listen as the people who speak. So it's gone from being something that was an idea to something that's quite a responsibility, I guess, as well. It, you, the correct word is responsibility. I think we feel it all the time now, that when, when people come to you because they're really looking for something, then you do have a real responsibility, not just to deliver stuff that's good, but also a responsibility not to deliver stuff that is dangerous or triggering or yeah. might cause problems. And the messages we get, Stephen, like, we read them among the team. I show them to Harriet and some family members. People are often like moved to tears when they read the messages. You know, we had a message a while ago from someone saying that he, they got in their car and they got in their car and they were listening to the High Performance Podcast a few days ago. And you know when you get in your car and turn your engine on, it can automatically just start playing because it, yeah, like, yeah. it connects to your Bluetooth. They said, I got in the car and it started playing the message, uh, the episode that I was listening to a couple of days before. And the message was so important. Again, the story which yeah. is what it is. The story was so important that I turned the engine off, removed the hose pipe from the exhaust, and went and collected my kids from school. So wow. that's someone who's right on the edge yeah. and is making an action to take their own life. Here's high performance and reverses that decision. And there's no sort of like credit to us for that. The credit belongs to the person that agrees to come onto the podcast and yeah. share their own struggles and their own challenges and their own story, but also the credit to the audience who maybe for the first time in their lives have said, I'm going to, I'm going to bring something into my life yeah. that is really going to change the way that I think, the way that I see the world. I'm going to actively seek something. So I think people don't just come to high performance for a bit of entertainment no. or for something to do for an hour. Yeah. They come to it to change the way they're living, the way they're operating, the way they're thinking, yeah. the way they're interacting, change their relationships. Yeah. So we can't mess around with it. You know, we have to be really quite careful about it. That's right. And, and, and one of the things, again, no spoilers, come and see High Performance Live at <laughs> Norwich Theatre Hall, 5th of February, um, is that you guys in the show are going to go towards your stories as well, because there is a real authenticity for you both, isn't there? And Damien, tell us a little bit about that for you, because you've had this incredible career supporting people in telling their own stories, finding their own high performance. Yeah. How did you come to that? Um, there's a, there's a great phrase that they use it, uh, in academia that they say, when we, uh, like, we don't do research, we do me-search. So most of what we're interested in is often trying to make sense of our own lives. And I think having engaged in that me-search, I think there's two things that sort of lead me to do what I do. Um, the first one is I grew up in a, in a boxing gym uh, in inner city Manchester. And when I, like, whenever you, you use that phrase, I think for a lot of people that are not familiar with that world, it immediately evokes sort of images of sort of like dusty, quite gritty in the city urban deprived areas. And I suppose my story fits that stereotype, if you like. So where, so where we grew up was classed as Europe's third poorest district. Yeah, so yeah. to give you an idea of a lot of the sort of social issues uh, that deprivation like that can bring. But the boxing gym was seen as a real community hub. So it was a place where people could go, they could be respected, they could be seen, they could be heard. Um, standards were expected of them that were better than what maybe the rest of the world would assume. Mm. So I think that informed a lot of my interest into, in the power of culture and environment and how that can raise uh, aspirations. 
But the second thing was I, I, I was around literally high performance from as far back as I can remember. So yeah. because it was a boxing gym, there was guys there that were going off to compete in the Olympic Games. There were guys fighting for world titles at like Madison Square Garden at New York, which sounded like some magical place for us. But these guys were actually going there and being seen and heard. So I think those two pillars of seeing how a culture can inspire yeah, yeah. high performance were were the things that informed me and wanted to try and understand it and be able to help other leaders or communities replicate that. Yeah, yeah. And, and Jake, for you, there was obviously that moment where you've been hugely successful in your career, yeah. but you wanted, you clearly wanted something more, more, more depth. And you know, we've got to know each other really well. You don't stop, do you? You, you, you no. don't want to be stuck. <laughs> you want to challenge yourself, which, yes. is, which is incredible. When somebody else in your position might go, no, I'll just, I'll just sit back. How, where did you find that within you, and how did you harness that? I think it probably, you know, comes down to when people say to me, oh, you've been incredibly successful, you've had this great career, you've done all these lovely things. <clears throat> Maybe it's a sad thing, but I don't really feel that. Yeah. Like, I, you know, I grew up about five miles from here in a little village, and I still feel exactly like the same kid that grew up there. <laughs> you know, I often say that of all the things I've done, the biggest thrill I've had is buying my first car, which was a, a green MGF. It cost me about nine grand, right? I've never had a bigger thrill than that. And I think it's a reminder that you kind of, you assume when you look at someone who's had a great TV career or has done all these great things and founded these businesses and stuff that they must get to a moment where they go, oh, I'm done. I can now relax because I've got a real sense of achievement. I've never really felt the sense of achievement. So maybe part of creating this podcast is looking for that sense of achievement. But probably more than that, I'm perhaps selfishly using it to find out why there is no amazing sense of achievement, right? <laughs> yeah. um, and actually the messages from all of the people that have joined us, you know, Johnny Wilkinson coming on the podcast and telling us that he worked hard for 20 years to win the Rugby World Cup and he felt joy for 30 seconds. Like that yeah. was a really good thing actually for me personally because I think, well, there you go. He's exactly the same. He wins the Rugby World Cup and feels like the same person that grew up in his house, in his school. Yeah, yeah. So I think that that was really where high performance stemmed from. Yeah, yeah. Looking for answers maybe. And I guess we... We, we need to cover it because this is Norwich Theatre yeah. talks. Yeah. But Norwich is really important to you, isn't it? Where you're from, being back here yeah. and, you know, supporting this place and, you know, running your, running your world and, run, and having your family here is really important to you. Is it, is it a grounding thing? Is it a pride thing? Probably both, I think. Yeah. I mean, I, it, it's amazing to me that people are so surprised every time when I say, oh, I still live in Norwich. Yeah, yeah. And they can't believe that you can, you know, run a production company based in London run one of the biggest podcasts in the country, be a TV presenter, all these other things, and be based out of Norwich. So I love that message. I'm like, listen, you can live in this city yeah. and you can do anything. But there is a real, there is a real sense of like defending where I'm from, I think. Yeah. You know, I, I saw just recently um, the Times voted North Norfolk as one of the top holiday destinations in the world for 2023. And I, whenever I see anything positive about that, I just share it on my socials and just put normal for Norfolk. Yeah, because yeah. like normal for Norfolk has become a phrase that people coined for like the negative side of the, yeah, yeah, where yeah. we're from. So I like to use normal for Norfolk as this is, you want to come to the, one of the best places in the world on holiday? Come here. It's normal for Norfolk, right? <laughs> um, and it is definitely a grounding thing as well. I hadn't really noticed it, but I remember my dad once said to me, he said, well, before you do a big thing, why do you always ring me and your mum? And I hadn't even really noticed that I do. Right. Yeah. But, you know, he said, well, before you did your first ever CBBC, you rang us for a bit of reassurance. Before you did your first Formula One show, you rang us for reassurance. When you did your first football show, you rang us for reassurance. And I think it is, like, weirdly, I do it less now that I live here. Yeah. Because I think I was almost like, you know, Harriet and I were in London, and I wanted that, that reminder of my roots and that kind of, like, safety net that home gives you. And actually, I don't tend to ring them now before big things because I'm here. Yeah, so yeah, I, yeah. I naturally have that. I see them all the time and stuff. Yeah. So, yeah, Norfolk is really, really important. Yeah. So back to the podcast. Mm. You, I, I, I was sort of thinking around this, and and you know, your the way in which you guys curate those stories and choose the stories you want to tell and extract from it, it's it's quite an art actually. Because looking back through the podcast you've done, you're coming from all different perspectives. You cover a huge range. I mean, I think it started focused on elite sport, didn't it? Yeah. But actually you've yeah. gone across a huge range of, 
uh, of different disciplines, different backgrounds, and different t different types of, of high performance as well. What's how do you make those decisions? Is it is it a constant discussion? Are you pinpointing where you'd like to go? Are you looking at the stories untold? Yeah, I think it's a really smart question, Stephen. I think um, I think the way that we tend to do it is whoever we decide to have on, and we'll talk about the decisions of that in, in, in a moment, I think the key element for Jake and myself is to always approach it with empathy. Yeah. To the, the, Rather than opinion. Yeah. And I think, like, I can give you a personal example where it, where I sort of fell into the trap of opinion rather than empathy. And, yeah, and yeah. So when we decided we were going to have Alistair Campbell on, for, uh, for example, so the Tony Blair's yeah, former spin yeah, yeah. doctor. Controversial character at times. Yeah, controversial yeah. character, but I think it, it, like, it bristled with me at first because mm. my only perception of Alistair Campbell was through the media where he can sometimes come across as a bit bombastic or hectoring yeah. or sometimes like a bit of a bully. Yeah. And I've got a real aversion to bullies. Yeah. So my first instinct was, I'm, I'm not sure I'm going to like this guy. I don't like the sort of public perception of him. Um, and it was Jake that pulled me up short and said, have you met him? Do you know anything about it? And I was like, the answer's no. Yeah. So he said, well, why don't you just give him a chance? Again, let's approach it with empathy. Yeah. And it was a really good reminder because when Alistair Campbell came in, he was generous, he was kind, he yeah, was sensitive. Yeah. You know, he, he was all the things that Absolutely. maybe I hadn't seen from, from a media perspective. And, yeah. and I, I often think of Alistair Campbell whenever we have any guests on because it's a reminder that if you come at the, uh, an interview seeking to understand and with a degree of empathy of looking to step into his world and see it from his perspective yeah. you'll yeah, often yeah. challenge your own perceptions and something yeah. shift and something shifts with it that's an incredible mm. approach isn't it i mean I, I i i can feel empathy with that because in my own role i i sit and we're offered a huge amount of work to bring to the stages and you know it's it's often like being a kid in a sweet shop at times but then you've got to step back and go that's not a story that interests me, but that is a story that's going to have some kind of resonance with somebody else. Or I don't like, you know, or I don't, can't attune to some of those messages, yeah. but they're stories that need to be heard. It's back to that point of responsibility again, isn't it? Yeah. And we have, we have a sort of a range of criteria, really, to make sure that those stories are heard, but also to make sure that they're heard by a, a, a large number of people, you know. It's, uh, maybe it's an ego thing. I don't think it is. I think it's more um, a sort of a passion for making this thing successful. Is that I love it when we get big numbers for high performance. So you know, I was just showing Damien. We've almost hit five hundred thousand downloads in a week for the first time this week right. while we're talking while we're talking now. And the reason why that's important to me is because I think the messages on the podcast are important. The number itself is kind of irrelevant, but yeah. actually, I want you know, I, I look at the 65 and a half million people in the UK that haven't listened to it this week and think, oh, why have you not <laughs> listened to this as well? Because it's really valuable. So I think it's really important that we have guests on who resonate with a large number of people. So it's important that sometimes we say, do you know what? Let's give this a go because this person's really recognisable and really well known. Yeah. Then the responsibility yeah, yeah, yeah. is on us to get something from them that no one's heard before. Yeah. To, you know, so um, by the time this goes out, people will have heard our episode that is released three days after we're talking right yeah. with Rylan. Yeah, yeah. And we start the conversation talking about the challenges in his personal life. And, you know, he's tried to take his life twice yeah. in, in the last year. And we really break down the fact that at the beginning of the conversation, Damien asks a brilliant question. And he says, who are we talking to? Are we talking to Rylan or are we talking to Ross? Yeah. And he just was really disarmed and went, who do you want? Yeah. We said, well, we want Ross. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then we have a conversation about the fact that Rylan is a millionaire. Rylan is on the telly. Rylan is asked to go for meetings. Rylan is lauded. Rylan is the person with a million plus followers across social media. Ross is left in the background, right? Yeah, yeah. Kind of decaying almost. Yeah. And you can't do that forever without some, some sort of implication on, your, on the real person, which Absolutely. is Ross. So that's a conversation with Rylan that people are not going to be expecting. And that will be really helpful for people that find that actually there's parts of their life that they really do neglect. Yeah. But then there's other people we have on, like we, last week was Mark Manson, so a best-selling author. Yeah. But he's not a f household name, you know. People aren't going to go, oh, yeah, Mark Manson. He writes an amazing set of books. But again, we started the conversation, and he said, no one's special. He said it's a mistake to tell people they're special. 
because otherwise they expect their life to be special. The truth is life's mundane 99% of the time. Yeah. And I actually got a message, I haven't told you, but I got a message on Instagram from someone saying, you've really let me down. Wow. The messages on your podcast are about the fact you can do anything and you can strive and right. you can push and you can be incredible. Why have you put a guy on there that says, we're normal, yeah. we're not special? Yeah, yeah. I replied and said, because I'm not saying you have to agree with Mark Manson, I'm saying that that's his opinion. That's right. What we can't, what, what high performance can never become is an echo chamber, right? Absolutely. Where it's the same people sharing the same messages and telling each other that they're right all the time. Yeah. The best thing we can do is have people like Mark that go, hey, guess what, you're not special. At the same time as we have, you know, Sir Clive Woodward coming on and talking about how you get elite people to be amazing because they are special, right? Yeah. Then it's up to you as the viewer or the listener to make your own mind up. Yeah. And if you want to totally ignore Mark Manson, that's great. If you want to listen to it and take a bit, that's also great. If you want to fully buy into the Mark Manson approach to life, that's also fine. Yeah. I think that's right, isn't it? And that's again comes back to you brought me on to kind of the next point I was going to raise, which is, you know, not every story you can tell is going to have a happy, en happy ending mm. to it. And that's and, and the challenge for me, and it feels, you know, programming theatres at the moment is we live in quite an imperfect world at the moment, but a world that is happy to discuss issues and issues are very prevalent and we have more ownership over our feelings about certain issues at the moment. And, you know, I'm happy to say that programming a theatre and some of the work we choose at times feels like treading on eggshells at points. Mm -hmm. Do you ever feel that when you're sort of going around certain subjects or, you know, where, where people are encouraged nowadays? If you don't have a strong opinion, then somehow you're kind of lesser than other yeah. people. Yeah. Whereas, you know, that, that, must feel, that must feel quite like treading a line at times in terms of protecting the individual, but also protecting the listenership. Yeah, a really good example of that that sprang to mind as you were, as you were making the point there, Stephen, was when we sat down with Tyson Fury. Yeah. So, you know, the, the world heavyweight champion, who's, like some of his comments are quite out there, quite, uh, quite explosive. Offensive. Yeah, offensive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and what we felt a, a duty for was we were prepared to tackle that with him. But then what was really interesting was he then let us into his world and spoke about his mental health struggles. And he yeah. spoke really powerfully about psychotic episodes that he'd experienced where... He told us about one occasion where he was driving home and he said to us, have you guys ever seen Postman Pat? Yeah. Yeah, and he described how his world turned into Postman Pat's world. Yeah, yeah. Which sounds funny to use that line, but actually when he's telling you, it was actually really upsetting and, uh, and disturbing. And I think in situations like that, we had a duty to almost challenge him for some of his comments, but do so under the caveat that this was a guy that was telling us he was ill. Yeah. So he was quite seriously yeah, yeah. ill at the time and, and I think the happy ending stuff was we both came away from it didn't we and, and, and we recorded it saying I actually feel sorry for him yeah this is a guy that seems to have all the riches of uh, the, the, you know that you could ever wish for and yet we came away actually feeling like really sorry for the situation yeah, that he's yeah. in that he's almost admitted he's yeah. addicted he's trapped yeah, in a totally. world of boxing that he wants to escape from do you think, and this is my final, we're going to have to wrap up quite soon because I could talk to you guys for days and actually over this next year you're going to see a lot of me out on the road. <laughs> Do you think there are, and this, this, this is a current point at the moment because a former member of a royal family published a book, didn't mm -hmm. they? Do you think there are ever stories that shouldn't be told? Do you think there's ever an instance? <sighs> I want to say yes, and I want to say no. Like, <laughs> yes, there are things that should remain private mm. for the sake of uh, for the sake of other people around you. Yeah, yeah, right. Mm -hmm. um, you have to have respect for them. You know, <clears throat> my wife is actually extremely private and would share way, way less than we ever do. And I have to sort of push the boundaries a bit and get told off regularly for doing things that she's like, why? Why? Do, I don't want that out there. I don't want people to. But then there's also, you know, people have a responsibility, I think, to share the things that they feel are important to them and that yeah. are good for them. And again, let's talk about Prince Harry, right? This book yeah. that he's released. It's really easy to come to that with an opinion. Yeah. Prince Harry shouldn't be doing it. The royal family's sacred. It's causing damage. It's causing problems. But let's come to it with an empathetic approach, right? Yeah. This is a guy who had an incredible trauma at a young age. Yeah. This is a guy who has lived a life that probably only one other person on the planet can relate to, which is... Yeah. William? Yeah. So we have to be empathetic to the fact that there is something within him that feels the need to tell these stories. 
Yeah. He feels wronged. He feels pain. He's clearly struggling in a number of different areas. And this is helping him. There's definitely some residual damage and residual impact that it's having. And I think we, you have to be mindful of that collateral damage. But I think my, I'd probably fall down on the side of through my job and this podcast and the way that I've lived and the way that I think. I think anyone can tell any story they want to tell. Absolutely. I think, actually. Um, and maybe sometimes you have to pick up the pieces afterwards or maybe you have to be really sensitive beforehand to explain to people what you're doing and why you're doing it. But then we also have to accept that we live in a world where people will come to Prince Harry with opinion rather than empathy. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, you know, we often use the phrase from Bill Bullard, an American politician who said, opinion is the lowest form of knowledge. Yeah, yeah. Because it requires no understanding of the person. Absolutely. It's all about yeah. empathy and walking in their shoes, you know. Yeah. I think it's a quote, from, I actually think it's a quote from Matilda, the musical, of all things, which is, respect my story. Yeah. And the key word there is my. Yeah, it's, yeah, yeah. it's my story and, and respect it because that's, that's how I've I, yeah. I see my life and my, and my journey. Let's turn back now to High Performance Live. Tell us, a, so for those listening to this podcast who might not have listened to High Performance, give, the, give them a quick route in to a kind of couple of episodes if they're wanting to prepare themselves to come to High Performance yep. Live and get under the hood of the podcast. Where, where would you oh, direct oh. them to? I'd start with one that uh, will probably surprise people that uh, haven't listened to it before. Um, the reality TV uh, star, Vicky Patterson. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Geordie uh, Shaw. Yeah, Vicky from Geordie Patterson. Shaw, yeah. 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 So um, I'm not her target demographic, Stephen. So, yeah. <laughs> so, so I wasn't that familiar with her work yeah. prior to us coming on. But then when Jake suggested that, uh, oh. that Vicky come on, I started researching her. And my first instinct was... Uh, I'm not sure uh, what what value we were going to get out of her. Yeah. Um, like reality TV, I wasn't sure how that could relate to high performance. But then when she came on, she was incredibly generous, but uh, really quite profound as well about yeah. living a life under a media glare and making yeah. mistakes on such a public platform and what that did to her, the damage to her mental health that ensued. But equally... The lessons she'd learned to be able to recover who she really was yeah. and to put her life back on an even keel yeah, yeah. so i'd encourage people to go and listen to that because again it might challenge your expectation yeah, like yeah. it did for mine but i came away from it really quite moved by how powerful and articulate yeah yeah uh, and quite profound she was absolutely and then to high performance live <clears throat> yeah jake tell just share a little bit on what you can expect coming to see the show either in Norwich, in London, cities around the country. Yeah, so well, I think what you can expect is to leave the show with a real idea and an understanding of how you need to put responsibility at the heart of your life. I think high performance comes back to responsibility. Now, I'm not saying high performance means you have a responsibility to achieve great things or to be hugely successful or to earn 10 million quid a year or to buy a massive house or to get a promotion. That's not what it's about. High performance exists to remind you that you have a responsibility to live the life that you really want to live and have a real sense of happiness. So we're going to start the show by explaining to people and reminding people that it is a miracle we're even here in the first place. Yeah. So let's not throw that miracle away um, by making poor choices, by not being kind to ourselves. And the Norwich show in particular is going to remind people that they are responsible. So we've got an amazing music act. It's someone who listens to the podcast. It's someone who has had to take responsibility for failure and setback and struggles and push through it. We're going to be joined by um, a previous guest actually on High Performance, a psychotherapist who's going to really lay down very clearly for people why we struggle, why we are often our own worst enemies and how we could be the opposite of that. Damien and I are going to talk to the audience and we're going to make it really interactive. We did a previous tour and we felt that while we were talking a lot to people, we didn't hear enough from them and yeah, there wasn't yeah. enough of a real conversation. So a big part of this show is going to be a proper conversation between us and the people in the room. We want them to feel like it's a really personal experience, that they've got what they want out of the night. But responsibility is going to be, the, I think, from my perspective, the biggest key theme. We had a really good, a cool conversation on the podcast recently with a guy called Matt Fraser, who's been voted five times the fittest man on the planet, right. five times CrossFit world champion. And he gave us a great analogy. He said, people need to take responsibility for changing their own lives. So 
when your car breaks down, if you stand on the side of the road and sit on the bonnet of your car, nobody will stop. No. The minute you take responsibility and you start pushing your car along the road, everyone can't wait to stop, get out, run over to you and help you push your car. Yeah, yeah. And that's what we want. We want to create this sense in the theatre that we're all pushing the car together. Yeah. We're yeah. all there for each other. But there'll be hundreds of people with very different things they want from the night. But I think that the central theme of you taking responsibility for what you want from your life yeah. is, is what's going to be really valuable for people. Fantastic. Well, tickets are still available on Sunday the 5th of February at Theatre Royal. But Jake and Damien, thank you very much for joining me in Podcast Corner at Playhouse. Thank you very much for being kind to me in you supporting did a great my job. own. Great I've job, man. No scary job hosting <laughs> two amazing, globally inspiring podcast hosts. And um, I'm really looking forward, and the whole team at Norwich Theatre, making High Performance Live with you guys. Thank you very much for bringing that to us. And uh, good luck with the show and the tour. Thank, Thank you. you very good much. Nice Thank you. Strictly Ballroom the Musical, the dazzling live sensation from Baz Luhrmann and directed by me, Craig Rebel Horwood. See Strictly Come Dancing legend Kevin Clifton in this spectacular dance musical that promises to be fab you less. Don't miss out. Book now. As I've said before, this is your podcast and we want to hear your feedback so that in future episodes across the rest of the year and beyond, we can shape the content and share the kind of discussion and give you the kind of updates you want to hear from us. Across our social media platforms, it's wonderful to see the excitement about the forthcoming shows, particularly Ron Bear's Peaky Blinders, which is at Theatre Royal um, in the middle of January, but also other forthcoming shows like The Girl from the North Country, the Bob Dylan musical, and all the way through to Cake, the Marie Antoinette musical. This month, as you will have read or heard, the opera company Glyndebourne, who have been touring to Norwich for over 50 years, have made the difficult decision that their touring relationship with the city will have to come to an end due to cuts they will soon receive in their funding from Arts Council England. As I've said publicly, I'm really disappointed by this decision and I think it is a really sad moment for Norwich and for our audiences that this relationship could come to an end. Prior to the pandemic, it was really clear to me that opera audiences were thriving here in Norwich and we know from all of the feedback we've heard since this news was revealed that you feel that disappointment as well. My primary goal here is that our audiences should not lose out, so I want you to be assured, those of you that love opera as your main art form, that we're working really, really hard to see how we can fill that gap so the audiences don't lose out and opera comes back to Norwich at the large scale and we'll be asking for a seat at the table in a national conversation to ensure our audiences here in the East aren't worse off than audiences elsewhere in the country. And for our next section, in each of these podcasts, it's really important to me that I get the opportunity to introduce to you some members of the Norwich Theatre team. And in our last podcast, you met Elspeth Hunter, who is part of our creative engagement team. And today, it's wonderful to welcome Sam Dawson, who is our head of creative engagement. And today, we're going to talk a bit about our Creative Matters seasons, which actually, Sam, we founded together mm -hmm. back in 2017, didn't we? Yeah. So for anybody that might not have been to one of the events as part of those seasons, tell us a bit about them. Um, so we've, we set them up um, as an issue-based season. Um, we felt there was a real gap um, as a place to discuss, a place to listen and understand really pertinent issues. Um, so we set up the season uh, multi-art formed uh, to bring people together um, and to talk about really important issues. And across those, gosh, five, six years. Mm. How many How many seasons have we done? I've lost yeah, count. I've had seven seasons. Yeah. Uh, and one of those was also online because of COVID. Yeah. And we covered a lot, didn't we? The very first season that we did was around gender and sexual identity. We've had seasons on caring for dementia, 
black British identity, to name but a, yeah. but a few. Yeah. What's been the impact of those seasons for you so far? Um, for me, there's been a real importance on the partners we're connecting with, and it's, we really seek the experts in the field. Um, they're really strong subjects, and we are not the experts. So for me, it's really about that partnership building. Um, but also, you start to see really different people coming to visit, yeah. and that's, that's just amazing, because we're really opening our doors for everyone. And of course, within each of the Creative Matters seasons, it's not that those are stories we wouldn't tell any other mm -hmm. time, but it creates a framework for those stories to be heard, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah, absolutely. It's been um, really focused attention on it, hasn't it? And month-long seasons um, where we're bringing different people together. Uh, and different ways to share those stories. So it's quite an intense period of time, but it really is focused yeah. for us, those subjects, I think. One of the really, there have been so many special moments across those seasons, and, and let's, let's share one each. I mean, for me, when we did the Black British Identity season mm -hmm. and we put Ballet Black onto yep. the, the main stage at, at Theatre Royal, the first time we've programmed that company, absolute delight to mm. welcome them. Mm. The audience response was incredible to mm. that. I remember being around stage door and somebody just coming up to me, a, a lady who identified herself as connected with the Windrush generation, yeah. who just held my hand and just looked at me and said, thank you. Yeah. And that was, that was such a profound moment for me. And, yeah. and across those seasons, you must have had oh, that gosh. kind of response as well. Yeah, there's been so many. Um, caring for dementia when we had a group of people stitching for the cloth of kindness yes. and then it, you know it's it's heartbreaking their experiences and their loss but also channeling that in a positive way collectively was, yeah. was so positive but deeply moving yeah um, and yeah so so many more and you know each creative matter season has had a different impetus hasn't it some it's been about sharing community building mm. some has been quite activist mm -hmm. in in its approach you know i remember the season we did around mental health in in men yeah you know a huge priority area often stories not talked about yeah. But actually, that was a real drive, wasn't it, for yeah. public health locally yeah. to raise awareness and referrals yeah. increased through that. So, yeah. you know, each season has had a different kind of drive, but, but stories have been at the heart of them, yeah. haven't they? Yeah, absolutely. Um, we attract different people. We, we talk about very different issues. And, but each time there's such a, a level of importance in the world and, and our position and what the theatres can offer uh, yeah. to bring people together to do that. Now, we've often talked about how when, when we've chosen um, which, which, where we should go next with Creative Matters, about not biting off more than we yeah. could chew and yeah. trying to make, you know, rather than, you know, one really good example, rather than talking about dementia, yeah. we talked about the caring experience yeah. of dementia. And for a number of years now, we've talked about wanted, Creative Matters being a great vehicle to mm. talk about climate change and climate action and the climate yeah. crisis. Yeah. And we've chosen to come at this from a story-based perspective, haven't we? Yeah. Just talk a little bit more about that for us. Well, I mean, it's such a big subject, isn't it, uh, climate? Everybody's talking about it. Um, it's it's really overwhelming for some people. Yeah. And I think for us, we are taking it from a story perspective. How can, what is the theatre's role in this? How can we bring people together to share, to understand and listen and possibly take action? And it might be that people take action by actually coming in and listening and yeah. trying to understand more. So we st we've been navigating our position in that, I think. Um, and finding our way because as we've said it, a lot of our seasons have been focused on the individual and f for this particular season it's about the whole planet isn't it and that's yeah. big and that's overwhelming for some yeah i think it's you know when there are seasons of work or programs or campaigns around the climate it's, it's often about you must go and mm. do this mm. you must go and change this this is you know it, it's quite sort of directive yeah it's, I know we've had a lot of discussion about what our role within that and you know we we do have a role we have a responsibility mm. as an organization mm. to reduce our impact but actually we've got a broader ro responsibility and we around debate and yeah. discussion yeah um, and the program that's reflecting that is 
very conversational, um, a lot of Q&As, a lot of discussions, again, bringing work onto stage as well, but having really diverse formats for people to come together, understand and listen, I think. Yeah. Give us an example of a few of the things that you've got planned yeah. already, because we're going to release the programme in batches, aren't we? This yes, is, we are, This yeah. is a shift for us as well. It's worth saying that Creative Matters previously have been intensive month-long seasons. Mm, mm. This, because of the enormity of the subject, mm. And because we want this to, to reach wider and deeper, yeah. is going to be across the whole of the year, isn't it? It is, yeah. So as you said, it's a very new approach for us. But I think it, for us, it means we can build up relationships. Uh, we can uh, create them along the way. It also gives us moments of reflection, I think, to sort of look at our work and, and look ahead a little bit more and take stock. Um, and... And it also it allows to build those audiences. So we might get someone in a discussion at the beginning. We might get them in a show at the end. Or you know, there's really broad ways to get engaged in that. Um, and some of the programmes. So we're going to start with creative writing um, yeah. with Steve Waters and climate writing in particular. Uh, we have theatre conversations here in the playroom. Uh, what is theatre's role in yeah. um, discussing climate? Um, and we are just about to release some of the shows, so I know one of them on sale is after that. Um, so it's uh, particularly focused for uh, eight plus uh, and looking at climate anxiety through clowning and really diverse format. Wow. So yeah. Wow. And so for for somebody listening who reads the news, consumes the media, is perhaps you know. Um, you know has that concern around mm. the world around us and you know here in Norfolk yeah. as well yeah. climate change has never been more present has mm -hmm. it we see the physical manifestation yeah. every day in yeah. terms of things like coastal erosion yeah, here in our county what would you say to them you know where somebody's feeling you know I, I do the things I'm told to do I do my recycling I turn lights off you know I'm really responsible but I feel I could do more why, why is creative matters and engaging with this season How's that going to help? I think, I mean, we've spoken a lot, Stephen, about trying to unify uh, yeah. and, and bring people together. And for me, it's about that. It's like, can we understand each other a little more? Can yeah. we come together, maybe take action, but actually, rather than being really divisive, can we come together and understand each other? I think that's really important for me. And that's the key thing, isn't it? Going back to the subject matter and yeah. indeed why we created Creative Matters was that collective exploration of something. Yeah. And then through climate change, we know this has to be joined up action. Mm -hmm. you know, no mm -hmm. person is gonna solve this on their own, mm -hmm. but actually five people together mm -hmm. stand a chance. Yeah, absolutely. We all hear stories in the news about the impact of climate change and we, we see this happening. Mm -hmm. What's the role within this season of people's own personal stories and their lived experiences? Um, well, I guess through the programme we, we, we invite those artists or, or those films and select and curate uh, the programme to have direct lived experience. So in particular our uh, film screenings, um, we've got one that was filmed in Haysborough, severe, yeah. Yeah. severe coastal erosion um, and a lady's experience there. And we have another which um, follows four girls around the globe and their personal experiences. So we're really trying to, to gain that through the programme and see the diversity of climate crisis. And that's a really important route mm -hmm. in for a lot of people because for some, you know, reading an article in a newspaper is mm -hmm. one thing, but actually hearing that from the point of view of somebody yeah. that has been there and has that as part of their own journey is incredibly powerful, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I think it can really hit home as well when we're thinking of our locality yeah. and on our Norfolk coast uh, rather than, you know, the globe. And I think that can really play a part in this. Absolutely. Thank you so much for talking to us, Sam. The Creative Matters programme will be released at various points during this year. Please keep an eye on norwichtheatre.org and across all of our socials for a whole range of different points of discussion, activities to take part in, and shows to attend. Thank you, Sam. Thank you. Well, that's it for episode two. And thank you very much for joining us and listening or watching. We really do believe in the power of stories 
to help people, to help society and to stimulate debate. And across everything that Norwich Theatre does, we're focused on the stories we tell and how we tell them. It's been fantastic in this episode to talk about two examples of how we're trying to harness the power of stories. Firstly, through High Performance Live, working with some amazing individuals who've created this phenomenal podcast to harness stories and help people really shape their own stories. And then about Creative Matters, Climate Stories, which is a year-long programme of activities and shows that helps us all engage with the life-changing story that is the one of our planet right now and how we all need to engage with those stories to reverse the damage done and take affirmative action. It's been wonderful to have you with us. We'll soon be sharing information about our third episode of Norwich Theatre Talks. And as ever, please give us your feedback. This is your podcast and we love to hear from you. Thank you.